Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Don an alcoholic. My sobriety date is September 16th, 1991. I'm 28 years sober. For that, I am very, very grateful. I want to thank my host, Bill, and his lovely wife, Maria, uh, for picking me up at the airport. And uh, before I get into my, you know, what I really enjoy talking about myself, uh, <laughs> take a moment and tell you something about my host, Bill. You know, Bill is a loving man. Bill's a good man. Bill's an honest man. And Bill is a damn fine member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the reason, although I just met him, that I know all these things about Bill is he took great lengths to tell me those things about himself. <laughs> so it's nice to have the microphone last, huh, Bill? <laughs> Dave and the committee for the uh, kind invitation to come here. I think it's an honor and privilege to be standing where I'm standing in front of you good people tonight, but I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that my true opinion is I think it's an honor and a privilege just to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, just to be able to come to rooms like this with folks like you on a continual basis and enjoy the gift of sobriety, this gift undeserved that I am so grateful is in place in my life today that I didn't think I wanted for a very long time, and then once I wanted it, Oh, I knew I'd never make it in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know what I mean? You walk in here and everybody's so put together and they're smiling, they're well dressed. And there's show offs in Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're new, <laughs> if you're new, you've probably met some of the show offs and they're giving you resentments. They gave me resentments when I was new <laughs> because they have things you can't imagine you'll ever have and they're waving them right in your face. I don't know, like valid driver's licenses and. Uh, <laughs> And there's an address on the license, and if you go there, they actually live there. <laughs> now, if that ain't showing off, I don't know what is. And, uh, <laughs> I enjoyed the countdown. We got some new people here tonight. I want to cordially welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I speak for everybody in this room, to our new friends in their first 30, 60 days of sobriety. I want you to know that we are delighted that you are here. But we understand... <laughs> But we do understand that if you're in your 30 or 60 days of sobriety, you may not be so, well, I don't know, delighted. So, Because we weren't delighted. Nobody gets here on a winning streak. We weren't delighted when we got here. And, but I got to tell you, you know, I haven't been sober so long that I don't remember what it's like to be new in Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's tough, man. It's tough because you're surrounded by people that are trying to buy you some time so God can do something in your life. They know they don't have the power to really do anything. If they could really reach in and take that thing out of you that makes you keep destroying your life, well, heck, they would have done it for themselves. They're trying to distract you, keep you busy, give you hope. They don't know if you're going to make it. They're just hoping. <laughs> They're trying to get you to the power. We're trying to buy you some time, but we're excited that you're here because if it worked for us, it can work for you, and we know that. Because we come in here, it has nothing to do with being bigger, faster, stronger, and smarter than the next person in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's not how you make it. If it had anything to do with the raw material we bring to the game, none of us would have made it. Because we come in here with our scorecards reading zero, and if you're in your first 30, 60, 90 days, I want you to know I've been right where you're at. And I know that's hard to believe, and you're thinking, no, you don't know me. You haven't even heard my story, my tragic tale. And, uh, but trust me. If you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, we know a great deal about you. For instance, this hasn't been a good year. <laughs> so welcome. as an alcoholic. I don't identify as anything else. I'm not an alcoholic and uh, I'm not a real alcoholic. I'm not a chronic alcoholic. I'm not a hope to die and just get on a banana peel alcohol. And I do that for identification. I don't want to be different than you want to be just like you, right? Try to be different my whole life. Damn near killed me. You know what I mean? People go left, I go right. They stand up, I sit down. They get in line, I go running around like a monkey. 
He's like, God forbid they see you trying. God forbid you fit in. God forbid I was like you because you might find out that I got problems. In Alcoholics Anonymous, I want to be just like you when I grow up. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. They were real men, tough guys. And I ran with tough guys. I'm a reformed tough guy. I know we got some reformed tough guys in the audience. I was a reformed tough guy now, you know, and I got here. I was a real genuine article, I thought. But I met real tough guys in Alcoholics Anonymous. They did crazy stuff. I couldn't even imagine how hard you had to be, you know, how strong your bones had to be. These guys went to work five days a week. (laughs) Crazy. Paid their bills. Drove registered vehicles. Were nice to their wives. Were helpful. I mean, they were tough. Tough. And it didn't matter. Things would go wrong in their life. Their transmission blow up. They'd lose a job. Somebody would get sick and they'd say, oh, well, and they'd mean it. How do you do that? <laughs> I think I'm a tough guy and I got that stuff on the outside, on the inside. I'm a, I'm a sensitive flower. Everything bothers me. I'm blown around by the winds of life. My heroes were the old timers and alcoholics anonymous. I thought, saw it walk through the storms of life. See, I don't need AA when things are going my way. You know, it's funny. I'm happy when things go my way. That doesn't make me unique. It makes me human. But I watch people that had a degree of dignity and grace and happiness and contentment when things weren't going their way. I watched their needle barely move when the winds of life blew. And I said, how do you do that? And they said it was God. I couldn't believe it. So I'm grateful to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and be with you tonight and tell you I'm a real alcoholic. I'm not a social drinker. Seen social drinking. Don't understand it much. Don't have any time for it. Don't have any use for it. I love the effect produced by alcohol. I drink alcohol and the the effect it produces in me and it takes me to the land of I don't care. And I want to live there. I want my mail delivered there. You know what I mean? (laughs) My beautiful wife, Eileen, 26 years sober, or 27 now. She'd shoot me if I said that. She's a good member of Alcoholics Anonymous and, uh, you know, boy meets girl on AA campus. And uh, we got engaged. And, uh, man, my older sister met my bride-to-be, Eileen, and pulled me aside immediately and said, if you screw this up, I'll kill you. Just fell in in love with my wife. They threw us a big engagement party, right? And there was social drinking at the engagement party, not not real drinking. You know, it was white wine drinking, not crash the car, go to jail, break a heart drinking, white wine drinking. <laughs> and so we're there at the engagement party drinking our club sodas, and my sister's in the kitchen with us, and we're chopping it up and talking. And she sees some friends arrive at the party, and she goes, well, I want to go say hi. I'll be right back. And my sister, social drinker, had a glass of white wine. And she set it on the counter, left the kitchen, and walked into the living room. My wife, Eileen, noticed this. And she looked at the white wine sitting unattended on the counter and saw my sister getting further away and looked at the white wine and saw my sister getting even further and turned to me in a bit of a panic and said, Pat left her wine. (laughs) And I said, yes, she did. She goes, well, should I go tell her? And I said, baby, she's not one of us at this particular moment. She's not suffering from separation anxiety. (laughs) I'm not a heavy drinker. I've drunk with heavy drinkers. Heavy drinkers have the ability to do stuff that I don't. It's called shut it down. I've seen heavy drinkers 11 o'clock at night. They look at their watch in the bar and they go, oh, my goodness. (laughs) I didn't realize it was getting so late. I have to work tomorrow. And they go home. I do not understand that drinking. I'm a real alcoholic. I've always been willing to ruin tomorrow for the promise of a few more hours of fun tonight. Why would you leave at 11 o'clock? Because you have a silly thing called a job. You have an investment. You got there at 5 o'clock. You've been working hard. And things have changed for the better by 11 o'clock, haven't they? I mean, you walked in at 5 o'clock. You saw the waitress. You weren't interested. 11 o'clock, she's got potential. You went in drinking alone. Now you got four or five slobbering friends that you're going to be together for life. Why would you leave that commitment after all that work just to go home and honor a thing like a job? Please. And by the way, while we're talking about alcoholic behavior, I have a sneaking suspicion that whoever's in charge of the heating and cooling system at this fine hotel... Perhaps, 
is one of us. Because there's a certain element to the behavior that I recognize is how I used to deal with resentments before I got sober. And it was so cold in here on Friday night, you could have just hung meat in there and it wouldn't have gone bad. And I think we complained too much and too loud and it got to the ears of maybe one of us. They said, oh, they were cold, were they? sounds like an individual that doesn't have a sponsor, doesn't know how to write a four-column inventory. <laughs> and he handled his resentment the way I would have back in the day. I said, well, I know one thing. They ain't going to be cold tonight. <laughs> told Bill if my head catches fire just throw water on me roll me around man because I'll tell you man when you're sitting there it ain't bad there's about a 15 degree drop jump in temperature right here if you see me going down I'm trying to find the vapor This is life or death. <laughs> hey, I got a home group. SOS men's group. My home group is a men's group. I don't care what your opinion is about that because I love my home group. And uh, boy, we have some uh, mentally afflicted gentlemen in that group, I'll tell you. <laughs> but we are a fine, well-oiled machine that works perfectly once in a great while. And uh, <laughs> But... We follow the dictates of a higher power. We believe in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, strong sponsorship and service. And we are doing well. Everybody in that group's got their hand on the rope. You know what I mean? And uh, that's not a big deal. Lots of groups, everybody's got their hand on the rope. The problem is they're pulled in different directions. So there's a lot of motion, but you don't get anywhere. And by and large, we're pulled in the same direction. We only have one job in my home group, carry the message to the alcoholic that still suffers. As far as I know, that's the only job in Alcoholics Anonymous. You might think there's other jobs from time to time. And when you're new, you might think there's other jobs because it's confusing. Service structure, GSR, area assemblies, corrections, treatment. And I all look like jobs. Like little, That's not true. They all facilitate one thing and one thing only. Carry the message to the alcoholic that still suffers. See, we're Alcoholics Anonymous. We're in the saving lives business. We do it better than anybody else. We do it better than the doctors and the counselors and the police officers and probation officers and family members and all the people who love us. Nobody does it as well as we do because we speak the same language. We have the same common experience. We have the gift of identification. And there's only one job in AA. And everything that we do in our home groups, in our business meetings, in our service structure should facilitate that end and that end only. And if it doesn't, it ain't AA. It just isn't. I don't know what it is, but it's not what we do. And in my home group, we average about 65 men every Wednesday night. We have a book study that averages about 45 guys every Monday night. Our big business meeting is every first Wednesday of the month, and we get about 45 guys to that business meeting. And that's a good indication that men have taken ownership of that group. And we got a nice mix of old dogs and young dogs and everything in between. And, I, man, I'll tell you, I hear people say they're worried about the future of Alcoholics Anonymous. I ain't. Man, come visit my group. We got these young men in there. I'm talking 18 to 23, anywhere from a couple of months to a few years of sobriety, and they are on fire with Alcoholics Anonymous. And they're walking tall with a bounce in their step and a glint in their eye. They're sponsoring each other. They're taking service commitments. They're there at the door. They're there for the new man that walks in. I couldn't be any more proud of the men in my home group. A man in my home group, I picked up the phone today, and it was a man from my home group calling to thank me because he celebrated four years of continuous sobriety. Now, I don't sponsor the man, but in my group, it's a tradition on your birthday, you call everybody that's, inf- that's affected your sobriety in a strong way. So this man called his sponsor, his grand sponsor, all the men in his home group, all the people in AA that he's met that have helped him along the way. He'll spend all day doing that, and we all do that on our birthday in Alcoholics Anonymous. See, my birthday's not about me. September 16th, 1991, it's not about me. I'd love it. My ego would love to make it about me. Look what I did. I stayed sober 28 years. Wouldn't that be a lie? I didn't do anything. I'm just a failure at the game of life that's been given a new purpose and was lucky enough to stumble into good AA. 
I owe everything to you good people. Every one of my sponsors I've ever had, everybody that's ever taken the time to have a conversation with me, up into this very moment, this very night, where I need to be an Alcoholics Anonymous. See, I understand. I need you. You don't need me. And I'm so grateful for what's been given me. But I want to tell you, I didn't get here. I got here the old-fashioned way, right? Drinking and failure, you know? <laughs> it's a great combination you want to get the AA. Because listen, if you're going to be an alcoholic, if you're going to go the distance, you can't let a little thing like looking bad slow you down. You know what I mean? <laughs> And I got a typical story, man. I got the beginning of my drinking story where there was no trouble. You know what I mean? I'm not picking up a tab, and I just love drinking. I got the second part of my drinking story, trouble. Trouble gets introduced. The kind of trouble that normal people just knock it off, right? But we're alcoholics, and my alcoholism will keep pace with any consequences that my drinking produces, right? And my alcoholism gave me the two best friends a drinking drunk is ever going to need if he's going to go the distance with his drinking justification and rationalization and what that looks like for a guy like me is I got to be able to go to jail and when I finally get released to face my family and face my woman and face the people that want the best things in the world for me that love me with all their hearts I have to be able to look them in the eye and jokingly say well <laughs> everybody goes to jail once in a while <laughs> no they don't <laughs> over 28 years. It's shocking. I've met thousands of people who have never been to jail. The doctor's opinion says my alcoholic life seems the only normal. You don't believe me? Here, let's play a little game. How many people in this room have been handcuffed? Oh, dear God. <laughs> Woo. Woo. I want to take a moment to explain something to you. <laughs> you don't get that in rotary. <laughs> it's worse in Virginia than I thought. <laughs> why do I do it? I mean, I understand why I drank when it was fun, when I was running 100 miles an hour, when I would have told anybody that listened, I won't stop doing this. Why would you? It takes me to the land of I don't care. I don't have to feel nothing I don't want to feel. I get to live in a synthetic existence. My fantasy world's good enough for me. Thank you. Where I was so happy with my drinking, if God Almighty had sat down on the bar stool next to me and said, Don, the next drink, the next one, is going to pass you into a region where there's no return through human aid. You're going to have to go to AA for the rest of your life or die a horrible alcoholic death. I told God Almighty I got the wrong guy because it's working for me. And that's easy to explain why I'm drinking then. But what about when trouble comes in? What about when I make my mom cry? What about that first car, that tenth car I crashed? What about all the blackouts, showing up in jail, failure, those thoughts when you wake up in the morning and go, I wasn't raised this way. Why do I drink on top of that? Why can't consequence stop a guy like me? Because I drink through heartache, I drink through consequence, I drink through health problems, I drink through breaking your heart, I drink through it all and I never tap the brake. Why is that? Because you see, there's something I'm going to have to overcome if I'm going to stay sober and Alcoholics Anonymous. You see, by the time I got here, I'm like a lot of you, I've been brainwashed, haven't I? And who have I been brainwashed by? Uh, people who love me the most. People that know me the best. And what do they say to me? Oh, Donnie, you're a great guy. You got a lot of potential. <laughs> Man, you could be anything you wanted to be if you just quit drinking. You could go anywhere you wanted to go if you just quit drinking. You know, you'd be so happy if you just quit drinking. All your dreams would come true if you just quit drinking. And what do I do? I take my experience and I lay it across that information. I go, let's see. Went to jail. I was drinking. Smacked that guy. I was drinking. Blew up the job. I was drinking. Blew up the relationship. I was drinking. Yeah, it makes sense in my alcoholic mind that I'm a wonderful human being. Just ask me. All I got to do is quit drinking and everything will be fine. But why can't anybody explain to me that every time I quit drinking in very short order, two to three days, I find myself in what the doctor's opinion describes as a state referred to as irritable, restless, and discontent. Quite frankly, I think that's the biggest understatement in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. 
Because it doesn't sound half bad when you read it when you're new, does it? It sounds kind of clinical. Irritable, restless, and discontent. <laughs> you imagine I show up at a meeting and I see my friend Bill, and Bill goes, hey, Don, how are you? I said, Bill, well, to be, a, to be completely honest with you, Bill, this particular evening, <laughs> I do find myself a tad irritable, restless, and discontent. <laughs> And what would Bill say? Oh, no, click your heels and say the third step prayer. You'll be fine. <laughs> but that's not how it feels, does it? I'm irritable. <laughs> I want to hurt you. Right? <laughs> I'm restless. I think I'll go over there. Nope, oh, they don't like me. Maybe I'll go over there. Nope, I don't like them. Maybe I'll get some ice cream. God, I'm getting fat. Um, <laughs> doesn't matter what I'm doing, who I'm doing it with, where I'm doing it. I'm with the wrong people doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. You know what I mean? There's no comfort. I can't find my place in the world. I'm like a dog circling his own tail looking for the right place to lay down. And I'm discontent. And when I come to AA, if you ask me what kills alcoholics, I said whiskey and car crashes without hesitation. Today I say discontent. Because everybody's got a saturation point, don't they? I'll tell you, you know what alcoholics like? You know what we do better than any group of people, any society I've ever encountered? You know what we do really well? We do wrong. Really well. We're okay with wrong, you know? Give me something that's wrong. Give me something to point to on why I feel the way I feel. You know, I, why I'm screwed up, why I lost my job. That must be it. You know, she left. That must be it. She's coming back. That must be it. Whatever. Give me... <laughs> We're good with wrong. Give me a bad medical diagnosis. Give me a reversal of the economy. Give me something I can point to. You know what makes us crazy? It just makes us nuts. It's when there's nothing wrong. But we feel like something's wrong. You know what I mean? You're laying there in bed at night and you're doing the math. You go, I don't know. I've been sober a while. That seems to be going well. My wife says she loves me. That's good. And she's not going anywhere. The job seems to go, I have plenty of money in the bank. I don't know. If it was any better, I go out back and hang myself, you know? And, you... <laughs> and we show up in our home groups. They go, How's it going, Don? And you go, Good, good. How are you? You know? <laughs> Why do I drink again after a brief period of recovery? Because I think I have a drinking problem. I don't understand I have alcoholism. It's the same thing, isn't it? No, drinking problems overcome by quitting drinking. Alcoholism, <laughs> quitting drinking only has a long-term effect to make you so crazy. You'll drink again to preserve your sanity. And I didn't know that. I kept going back to it again and again and again, knowing it wouldn't work, knowing I was going to blow my life up again. And I had a horrible secret when I come to Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not that tough guy stuff. Hell, you give me a couple of drinks of whiskey, I'll brag about that stuff. But the big secret I brought into Alcoholics Anonymous is shameful and it's embarrassing, which is I hate the way I feel when I'm sober. And it's shameful and it's embarrassing in light of how I treat the people that have the misfortune of loving me. When you see me roar through their life year after year after year like a tornado, and the best I have to offer is I'm sorry. How woefully inadequate is that in the light of the devastation and destruction I bring into my family? But it's all I got. And when I tell you I'm sorry, I'm not lying. When I tell you I didn't mean to treat you this way, I'm not lying. When I tell you it's going to be different in the future, and I'm not going to drink no more, I'm not lying. But I didn't understand that there's no room for the truth where the game of alcoholism is played out. I didn't realize I'd lost the power of choice when the drink was concerned. I didn't realize I was doomed to repeat the desperate experiment of the first drink over and over again. Because when I quit drinking, I am set into a state of irritable, restless, and discontent nature. And I will take it as long as I can. And sometimes that's two days. Sometimes it's two months. But I'll hold on because I know I can't drink. I can't drink. It means heartache. It means failure. But I get crazier and I get crazier. And I don't drink to break your heart, crash a car, go to jail. I drink to overcome a mental obsession beyond my human power. And because I don't understand that's happening, I'm bringing a knife to a gunfight. And I'm getting slaughtered out there. And I'm drinking in ignorance. And I think I've gone crazy. I think I've lost my mind. And I go into the well-known stages of a spree. And I tear my life up and I tear your life up. And I emerge from this what? Remorseful. 
with a mumbling apology that I'll do better and it won't happen again. And this is repeated over and over again. And unless something big happens, an entire psychic change, I will live that way until I die. And that is the first step in Alcoholics Anonymous. There ain't no hope in the first step. It ain't about if I'm going to drink again. It's about when I'm going to drink again. Here's a short version of the first step. We are screwed. (laughs) And if I don't understand the kind of trouble I'm in in step one, let me tell you, I'm not going to work the rest of these steps with the kind of focus and energy required for successful consummation. Because why would you? I did everything you read about in chapter three. I pulled the geographics, brief periods of recovery, followed always by a still worse relapse, a feeling I was regaining control to find out I'd lost even more control. Pulled the geographic, went to Boston. I'm living in L.A., born and raised there. I figure L.A. is my problem. I moved to Boston. I find out they drink in Boston, you know, and <laughs> I'm in Boston for three years. So I wear out my welcome and I. And I come back to Los Angeles and I land on my feet like I always do. I get the best job I've ever had in my life. And I don't mean my best job drinking. I mean, to date, it might be the best job I ever had. Because alcoholics, we're amazing, man. We're like a cat (laughs) flung outside a second-story window. (laughs) And we just sail through the air and land on our feet. Boom. In a three-piece suit and a job interview. You know? (laughs) And we get the job. (laughs) We can get the job, get the girl, get the money. We're great getters. We're lousy keepers, you know what I mean? (laughs) And I got this great job. You know the rest of the story. You do a good job for a while. The minute they tell you, boy, you've really done a good job, your alcoholic translator goes, you should slack off. And the old behavior comes in. And you stop hiding it. You're missing work. You're showing up drunk. And I got fired for my drinking. Again, shocking. But that's okay. I'm a victim. I'm not just an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic slash victim. Nothing's ever my fault. So I just play the victim card. Call up my sister in Simi Valley, California. Say they threw me away after all I did for them. <laughs> and I asked for a place to come get on my feet. My beautiful sister has to tell me that she loves me. And I come to her house. But if I drink, I can't stay in her house. Because everyone knows I'm a drunk. And I told my beautiful sister, Patricia, I won't drink, I promise. And I meant it when I said it, but there's no room for the truth where the game of alcoholism is played out. And I drank every day in that house for probably six, seven months before I got sober. If you don't know how you do that when they're watching you, well, maybe you're not a sneaky rat like I am. I got no problem drinking around your schedule. What time do you go to work? 7 a.m.? Bars open. <laughs> and this is the end of my drinking. This isn't where I'm drinking to feel I'm bigger, stronger, faster, better, have the courage to ask that pretty girl to dance. This is oblivion drinking. This is light switch drinking. This is get the whiskey on board hard enough and fast enough to shut off the head so I can black out in the room. I'm mooching off of my family to wake up and face the hideous four horsemen. Terror, frustration, bewilderment, despair. That is what my life has been reduced to. I don't drive. I don't work. I live from unemployment check to unemployment check. I'm drinking to die. I see no safe direction. And I don't know what to do. I'd love to tell you I have anything to do with what happened in the next four or five days, but I don't. And I'm not sure God intervened or I just got damn lucky and I don't care. Because I walked up to my brother-in-law one day. I'd got an unemployment check and I said, Larry, I got my check. Can I borrow your car? And he asked me that funny question. Will you be coming back this time? (laughs) Because I borrowed his car a few times and been, I don't know, tardy returning. (laughs) The 12 and 12 tells me my outstanding character is, is... characteristic is defiance and when Larry said that I got right in his face I said Larry how dare you (laughs) you know the last time this happened I apologized to you I opened my heart to you and I don't really need this crap and Larry untreated Al-Anon that he was felt terrible (laughs) and he took his car keys out and I snatched the car keys from this man I'm mooching the room from to go get in his car and I remember thinking there better be gas in it you know just (laughs) I went down to the liquor store to cash my unemployment check because that's where drunks like me cash our checks. And I have what the big book refers to as the thought that precedes the first drink. 
And for me, it's always the same. Eh, what's in a half pint of whiskey? Nobody ever went to jail drinking a half pint of whiskey. So I got the half pint of whiskey, and I drank it. It went so well, I bought another half pint. Then I thought, you know, I can go visit those friends in the valley. I'll be back in 45 minutes. They won't even miss me. And I am gone. Three days later, I'm driving up the hill to face that family I'd done over one more time. One more time, I've taken their hope, their faith, and their trust, and I've torn it to shreds. You need to understand this. Driving up the hill to save that family I'd done over one more time, I love them no less than I love them at this very moment. And I love my family tremendously. But I only got time to serve one master. I can't serve two. And that's king alcohol. And you get between me and a drink, it's nothing personal. It's almost business-like. I'm getting to the drink. I'm going around you, through you, manipulating you, telling you what you want to hear. But bet your bottom dollar I'm getting to the drink. But when I don't understand alcoholism, I can't warn you. I can't tell you, look, I love you, but it's going to happen again. I'm going to look you in the eye and tell you I'm sorry, and I mean it, but I'm going to hurt you again. I'm in the grip of this thing. I feel like a puppet on the end of the string. I feel like I'm possessed, and I ain't calling the shots. And I'm telling you, you need to get away from me. You need to save yourself. But when you don't know what you suffer from, you can't warn them. So you say things like this. Ah, man, I'm so sorry got away from me. Can you give me another chance? And it got hard for my family to give me those second and those third and the 30th chances when I kept roaring through their life. I walked into a home that's been devastated by the disease of alcoholism to face the heat. And I found out in my absence, an argument had broken out between my brother-in-law and my sister. My brother-in-law wanted to report the car stolen. My sister negotiated down to a missing persons report. And when they saw me show up, they called the police, and now they're on their way to do the follow-up investigation. I have warrants for my arrest in two counties because I am an overachiever. (laughs) So I start yelling at my sister, I got warrants, I might go to jail, thanks for nothing, because now it's her fault. I go outside to wait for the police because I don't want the interview to go on in front of the family. I don't know what I'm going to be saying but I'm fairly certain I'm going to be lying. And and I'm out there smoking a cigarette, and here comes the black and white. On the side of the black and white, it says canine unit. And I think, ah, great. (laughs) They brought the dog. (laughs) Like I'm in any shape to make a run for it. And and the cop got out, and he started asking me those hard, tough questions that trained professionals will ask, like, where were you? And uh, <laughs> everything I remember is illegal, so I'm lying, man. He's looking at my eyes really hard, so I'm breaking his gaze. He's breaking with me, so now we're interviewing and dancing. And, <laughs> and I don't feel good, man. I just want to divert his attention, and I see the do- dog in the back seat. And I point at the dog, and I said, so is that your partner? <laughs> and, uh, and he says, well, yes, it is. And he walks over, and he opens the door, and this dog gets out. German Shepherd, not a hair out of place. Like a Rin Tin Tin reincarnate. And with no prompting on my part, he started to relay facts to me about the dog's life. Uh, The dog was recently past mandatory retirement. They haven't retired him yet. He's too good. The dog has participated in more arrests than any dog in the history of Ventura County. The dog has participated in more arrests and rescues than any dog in the history of Ventura or Los Angeles County. This dog was so phenomenal that the officers took a collection out of pocket to send him over to Europe for international competition where he kicked butt on German, German shepherds. at this dog and I, I turned to the opposite. I go, well, that's a phenomenal dog you have there, sir. And this thought flew in the back of my mind. The kind of thought you want to deny it, but the minute you think it, you know it's the truth. And what the truth was is this dog had done significantly more with his life than I'd done with mine. <laughs> <laughs> and I hated that dog. <laughs> And I finished up with the police, and the cop didn't take me to jail, and I walk into the house been devastated by alcoholism, and they want me gone. Can you believe that? They want me gone. And my sister, years later, I asked my sister, you know, you asked me to leave your house that day. And the whole time you talked to me, you couldn't take your eyes off of your shoes. You couldn't look me in the eye. Why was that? 
And she said, I didn't want you to lie to my face one more time. You see, that's what I bring into the family. And when she asked me to go, if I had any respect for another human being, if I had a true partnership with another human being, I would have got my gear and cleared out. It was fair, but I'm an alcoholic and I'm not too proud to beg. And I beg for another chance. Please, I'll die out there. I got nowhere to go. I'm so sick. You got to give me a couple of days. I don't know. I'll go to AA and everything. I have no idea why I said that. (laughs) This day, I think it was an over demonstration. And it's not like my family believed I was going to go to AA. My first night or my first week in AA, uh, my sister was taking me to AA and driving me home from AA. You know how it makes you feel when you look the way I look and your older sister takes you home from a long evening of Alcoholics Anonymous? She's driving her 31-year-old loser brother home in her compact car. So, Donald, what'd you learn in AA tonight? You know, and, <laughs> I don't remember my first night in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was detoxing pretty hard, suffering from audio and visual hallucinations. But I'll tell you what, I remember my second night. And I'll tell you something about that. my second night in Alcoholics Anonymous. Number one, I did not look that night the way I looked this evening. You know, I got a friend, Bob, that says something I really like. He goes, the problem now is we're all cleaned up and we're old, man. We got here, we were a mess when we were young, you know, and now we try to talk to these young guys. And sometimes you're talking to a young guy carrying the message, and you can see him looking like this old guy, all stable, all clean, you know, the you know, car's nice, but he hasn't been where I've been. Bob goes, you know, the problem with AA is we clean up and we change so much and we stay sober. He goes, what should happen when we're brand new is we should get a mugshot, right? <laughs> and then we can put it on T-shirts, right? <laughs> And so when you're talking to a new person, when you think you're starting to lose them a little bit, you go, oh, yeah, look at this. Ah, and, you know? <laughs> and a new person be like, I had no idea. <laughs> but I'm in the Simi Valley Alano Club, man, hanging out between the 6 o'clock and the 8 o'clock meeting. I got my back against the wall. I got hair down the middle of my back, and it's filthy because I don't shower anymore. I got a full beard with food stuck in it. I've lost the ability to speak the king's English. I communicate in a series of hand gestures, grunts, and clicks. I got my sunglasses on at night. I got my arms folded across my chest. I got my tough guy radar out, and I'm just rocking back and forth, surveying the room of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm not rocking back and forth, holding myself, because I'm a tough guy. I'm doing this because every molecule in my body is screaming in unison, let's go get a drink, because I'm coming up on 48 hours without a drink of alcohol. And I'm physically addicted, and I'm coming out of my skin. And I want to tell you, they were giving me a wide berth at the Simi Valley Alano Club, because I am dangerous, because I'm terrified. And anybody terrified is dangerous. And the good members of Alcoholics Anonymous are staying away from me that night. My head starts talking to me. Look at them, Don. They're not even talking to you. And they're clean and they're happy and they know each other. And they don't want you here. And why do you do this to us, Don? You're quitting drinking? Oh, and now you're in AA like it's going to be any different? How many times you quit drinking, Don? A hundred? You think it's going to be any different around here? Why do you do this to us, Don? You put us through all this pain and then what do you do? You drink anyway. All this pain and you drink anyway. I'll tell you what, Scooter, let's try this. Why don't we bypass the pain? Let's get out of this joint and let's go get a drink. You're going to do it anyway. You know it. I know it. Let's cut out the middle, man. Let's go get drunk. And I'm leaving Alcoholics Anonymous. And I ain't leaving AA because it doesn't work. And I'm not leaving AA because God doesn't exist. And I'm not leaving AA because the steps aren't a miracle. And I'm not leaving AA because strong sponsorship isn't available. I'm leaving AA because I don't have the human power to overcome a mental obsession. It's beyond my strength. And I got to go. And I got to get a drink. This is what I do. And I caught a break. Because over in the corner were two good members of Alcoholics Anonymous named Lou and Mark. And it's the most important moment of my life. Whether I live or die will be decided in the next few minutes. But for Lou and Mark, it was Tuesday. (laughs) And Lou and Mark were where they were every Tuesday between the 6 o'clock and the 8 o'clock meeting at the Simi Valley Alana Club. They were drinking that bad AA coffee, telling those old war stories, telling those off-color jokes. And they were hanging out together, and they had their eyes trained on the door, and they had their eyes trained on the room, and they were looking for men to 12-step. And the way they tell the story is they saw me, and Lou looked at Mark and said, Whoa. (laughs) 
And Mark looked at Lou and said, uh-huh. And Lou said, well, I bet we can't get him sober. Mark said, well, we are here. And they did what I think is the most important action we'll ever take in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Two good members of AA walked 30 feet across the clubhouse to cordially welcome a man to Alcoholics Anonymous who is dying from the disease of alcoholism. Why do I think it's the most important thing we do? 30 feet for Lou and Mark? For me, it's a million miles. Don't you know where I've been, what I've done, who I've hurt? Don't you understand? I can't get my eyes off my shoes. You expect me to shake hands? Are you insane? You see, Mark and Lou understood the terms of engagement for recovery from the disease of alcoholism, that they would have to carry the message to the alcoholic that still suffers. My only job was to receive it. And they sat me down on the table, and they got me a half a cup of coffee, and Mark sat with me. And Lou stood and clapped me right in the middle of my back. He said, Don, this is Mark. He'll be your sponsor. And then he walked away. (laughs) And they assigned me my first sponsor in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I know that's not done everywhere, but it was a good idea and my choice because I couldn't have picked a good sponsor. My life depended on it. And, you know, it's a funny thing. We don't do that, but we say some weird stuff to new people. We say it to them because people said it to us. We don't even think about it anymore. My favorite thing we say to new people is find a sponsor that has what you want. Huh. I wonder what I want my second night of recovery. (laughs) Oh, I don't know. Maybe a pharmaceutical rep with a spare Cadillac? (laughs) Because I'd have never picked the weenie boy they assigned to me, you know what I mean? Because he's everything I'm not. He's clean cut. He's soft spoken, bald of head, wire rim glasses and... Ooh, he's got something that I don't have for anything in the universe. And he's got it for God and AA. He's got reverence. You could feel it coming off of him. I just met this man. He's looking me right in the eye and he's going, Don, we're one of the, we're the lucky ones. We made it to Alcoholics Anonymous. They're out there in the streets tonight and they're dying, but you made it in here with us and you're safe. And it's going to be great, kid. You come with us. We know the way. It's going to be wonderful. Isn't this great? I suppose. (laughs) And it wasn't what he said. It wasn't what he said. It was how he said it because he was armed with something I had never been exposed to before. And he was armed with spiritual enthusiasm. He was a man that had a real answer, who had had a profound change in his life, was sufficiently armed with facts about himself was willing to go to the most sordid place or talk to the most sordid person on the planet, convinced that God would keep him safe. And he had a solution, and he was giving it away that night. What I did with it was between me and God, but he was carrying the message. And he got a a meeting directory of Alcoholics Anonymous, and without my permission, I might add, (laughs) he started circling the meetings I'd be attending in Alcoholics Anonymous. The way I figured that out, he said, Uh, These are the meetings you'll be attending in AA. And and I remember thinking, that's an awful lot of circling. And at one point, why he was telling me about AA and God and his sponsor and this stuff that made no sense to me, he stopped circling and he said, are you working? I said, no, I'm currently unemployed. More circling, more circling, more circling. He got me a big book. He got me a 12 and 12. He handed me the meeting directory, and then he insulted me. Because if you're going to sponsor new people, for God's sakes, get off on the right foot. (laughs) Try to insult them as soon as possible, because you cannot help but to insult a newcomer. We are so sensitive when we get here, aren't we? We walk in the meeting. How you doing tonight, kid? Kind of a personal question, don't you think? (laughs) You know? He says to me, do you think you can go home tonight and not drink? That's just rude, isn't it? (laughs) I'm coming up on 48 hours, for God's sakes. I'll be honest with you, it kind of pissed me off. So I kind of snapped at him and I said, look, buddy, any idiot can go a day without drinking. And he lit up like Christmas. He said, oh, you're going to be perfect for our program. But man, that's AA, isn't it? You know, the worse you are, the more we like it. God, you know, 
I start telling my sponsor about my problems. I got warrants for my arrest in two counties. He goes, of course you do. I don't have a car. I haven't had a car in a year. Why would you? <laughs> I live at my sister's house. Well, where else would you live? You know? And I owe the IRS 80 grand. Absolutely. And he's happier and he's happier and he's happier. The worse my life is, the happier he is about it. I remember... This is a weird reaction. When he asked me if I was working, I said, no, I'm currently unemployed. He said, oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> Let me tell you, out there in polite society, if you meet somebody and they go, so what do you do for a living? You go, well, I'm currently unemployed. They'll be embarrassed. They go, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know. I'm sure you'll find a, guy, a job soon. And they just want to get away from you. Not a, hey, not a, hey, oh, you're not working? That's great. <laughs> Oh, you're half dead. Beautiful. <laughs> Nobody in the world will talk to you. Great. Terrific. <laughs> Welcome. You know, nothing between you and sobriety. Good, 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 good. <laughs> Man, these are old timers. These are guys that have been through the process. These are guys. These guys that understand the mechanism for propulsion of untreated alcoholism driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-seeking, self-delusion, and self-pity, right? They won't tolerate that stuff in AA. And if you don't understand why, it looks like they're harsh. And it's not that they're harsh, it's just alcoholism is harsh. Alcoholism kills people. And good sponsorship would rather hurt your feelings and save your life. Hate me now, love me later. So there's no self-pity in AA. Because i got a lot of things I'm feeling a lot of self-pity about. Number one, I haven't worked in a year. Oh, the IRS, 80 grand. I remember my sponsor looked at me and laughed about it. He goes, well, that's a lot of money. He goes, maybe you'll never pay it off, but you'll be sober and broke. And, uh... <laughs> but he immediately took that bit of information and put it into service in Alcoholics Anonymous. For the next five years, if any newcomer had the audacity of complaining about his little $1,200 IRS debt, this would be my sponsor. Hold that thought, Jimmy. Hey, Don, you got a minute? <laughs> and I'd innocently plod over, and he'd go, Don, tell Jimmy how much you owe the IRS. <laughs> and I'd say, I owe the IRS $80,000. <laughs> and Jimmy'd go, Jesus! <laughs> and I'd say, just want to be a service. <laughs> your big problems. Bring them in here. We'll put them to service. We'll find a use for them. Nothing else your life will suck so bad like mine is. You'll make other people feel better about theirs. I used to complain and whine to my sponsor. He goes, he wouldn't argue with me. He goes, yeah, Don, you got a terrible life. It's true. He goes, Don, I make a gratitude list every night. And since I started sponsoring you right at the end of the gratitude list, I say, thank you, God, that I'm not Don. You know, <laughs> to get that kind of love anywhere else. <laughs> and this man loved me enough. He didn't just take me through the 12 steps. He didn't just take me through the traditions. He didn't just take me through the concept. This man taught me how to be an AA member. It's a lost art, I think. Right? Because it's taught by experience, not by book. You see, this isn't academic. This is spiritual. This isn't of the head. This is of the heart. This is of the spirit. This is one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic to reduce his feelings of difference so he can start to take actions he does not yet believe in. And that is done through the ancient spiritual principle of invitation. See, I'd rather watch a sunset than listen to a sermon. See, my sponsor wasn't a used to. He wasn't a guy that could tell you what he used to do in AA, and it'd probably be good if I did it too. He was currently doing the deal in Alcoholics Anonymous. He invited me into his AA life. My first night with my sponsor, I didn't realize what had happened. But I didn't understand that now I had a whole host of new friends because he had a lot of friends in AA, and I didn't understand. When someone's got a lot of friends and they sponsor you, you get their friends automatically. That's how it works around here. <laughs> My sponsor had a home group, and he was an active member, which meant, guess what? I have a home group, and I will be an active member. 
And he invited me into his life, into his car, into his home. And their, his friends invited me into their lives and their cars and their home. And his whole family, this community sprung up around me. And he taught me how to be an AA member by example. And he left me with some dignity because of that. He didn't tell me what to do. He'd say, Don, tomorrow night, I got to do setup. I got to get here about an hour early. I could really use some help. Do you think he could help me? And I think my sponsor needs my help. I say, sure, sponsor, anything for you. I'd feel good about that. I was a couple of months sober, and he came up to me, and he said, Don, you know, we're having problems with corrections in this district. You seem like a pretty smart guy. We'd really like your input. Would you get on the ad hoc committee with me? And I thought to myself, wow, I got the AA just in the nick of time. <laughs> See, I'm a street guy. I come to Alcoholics Anonymous, man. I disturb your meetings. I don't mean to. I just don't know any better. I didn't know there's just a whole list of rules handed down from old timer to old timer about how we act in AA. It's not written anywhere, but it seems to be. But this guy was willing to risk my wrath to teach me the unwritten rules of Alcoholics Anonymous. And see, my first 30, 60 days, he'd be yanking me out of meetings. It got to the point that he'd give me that curly finger, come here, Don, and I'd think, now what did I do? And I found out about the grave infraction I had committed that. Don, if you're bored in a meeting, you can't go in the corner and do push-ups. Don, you can't get up and go to the bathroom six times and disturb everybody. Don, you can't threaten to kill an old-timer and make amends later. Don. <laughs> Because, man, when we're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, it's dog rules. You know what I mean? If you don't have somebody to explain it to you, tell you how to do it, you're going to break bad constantly. And, it's gonna, and you're going to get frozen out. You're not going to feel comfortable around here. Because it's dog rules in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm telling you, I got a dog. He's nine years old. Just turned nine a couple of days ago. Bo the Wonder Dog. And if you met Bo and spent five minutes with him, you would turn to me and go, Don, that's an amazing dog you have there. And I go, yes, he is, man. He's a good boy. But Bo, like any dog you could think of, was a puppy once, right? And I remember being on the phone with a sponsee, and Bo walked into my line of sight, and he's, it may, we've had him maybe a couple of weeks, man. He's a few months old, you know, and a uh, cute little puppy. And I remember thinking, oh, there's Bo. I love that little guy shaking his little puppy butt. And then he went into a crouch, you know what I mean? And, I, <laughs> and on the phone, I go, oh, no. And, uh, and my sponsee goes, what's wrong? I go, oh, Bo's taking a dump in the living room. <laughs> he goes, do you have to go? I go, nah, it's too late, man. No, man, you can't interrupt him. You'll traumatize the little guy, you know? <laughs> That's not how you do it. You got to kind of stalk him, kind of keep an eye on him, you know? And, and when he looks like he's going to break bad, you got to grab him and head for outdoor. It will freak him out a little bit because he'll be like, I'm in the air, I'm in the air, I'm in the air, you know? And, but you get him outside and you drop him on the lawn, and you step back and you look at him, and he'll look at you with all honesty with those cute puppy eyes like, what the hell was that about? And, uh, and he'll realize he's outdoors. He'll go, oh, I'm outdoors. I kind of got to poop. And if he, if he does poop, you better throw a party, right? Hooray! Hooray, Bo! And he'll get all excited. And he'll look at you with his innocence and go, oh, man, I did not know. You want me to poop out here? I can totally do that. I love you, man. And my sponsor did exactly the same thing with me when I was new in AA. telling you maybe you'll have the experience i've had a thousand times man maybe you're walking to your home group like i did a few weeks ago and i and i walk in man and there's jimmy and jimmy i'm telling you two weeks earlier jimmy crawled out of the bushes into our aa meeting you know what i mean and we put him on somebody's couch and we got him cleaned up and we're taking him to and from me couldn't talk in complete sentences and there's jimmy in the back and he's making the coffee and I'm like, oh, my God, Jimmy's making a coffee. Jimmy, Jimmy, kid, Jimmy didn't even know if it was day or night two weeks ago. He's making a coffee. It's a miracle. Now, I'm not drinking the coffee tonight. But, <laughs> right? But Jimmy's making a coffee. And, you, you know, and it, your heart feels right. And you go to another meeting, right? And there's, there's Mary. Mary's setting up the literature. Mary is 45 days sober, right? You remember Mary, her first 30 days. Her first 30 days, Mary cried from beginning to the end of every meeting. It got so bad, old timers would walk by where she was sitting with a box of Kleenex. They wouldn't even say hello to her. They just dropped the Kleenex. Because <laughs> they knew. And now 
she's in the back, she's setting up the literature, and all the books are in perfect angles, and all the literature's perfect, and she's standing there like she's on duty, just like a literature, and your literature's over, and you're thinking, oh my God. <laughs> and maybe you'll see the most beautiful thing in the world. You show up at your home group, one of our newer members is at the door, and you'll see them put their hand out, and they'll cordially welcome somebody to Alcoholics Anonymous. And in that moment, you'll realize that the chain remains unbroken. And you realize there's nothing more important in life than having a front row seat and just observing the hand of the master working the life of someone else. Being sometimes a more active, sometimes a more passive, but a witness to the resurrection of another human being. That happens on a regular basis in Alcoholics Anonymous. As Bill referred to it, this whole self miracle that's happening among us. And I don't know where I'd be. And you know what? I'm ungrateful at times. I feel like I have to do things in Alcoholics Anonymous rather than I get to do things in Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, I remember a couple of months ago, you know, I showed up early in my home group because I had to meet a guy that I sponsored. I had a big business day ahead of that. I was tired when I met with the guy. And then I stayed for the meeting. I got to meet with another guy after the meeting, you know, and I'm feeling good about myself because I'm checking the boxes. But that's what it was for me that night. I'm checking my AA boxes. I don't have any real gratitude. And it's been a long night. And why I'm meeting with these guys, why I'm doing this, I'll be honest with you. My self-centered ego is sitting there and it's doing math. You ever have that guy? It's doing math. Well, I'll be out of here by this time. I should get home. I'll get some dinner. I'll be in front of watching ESPN by 10 o'clock. It'll be fine. And I'm thinking about what I'm going to do when I get home from the AA meeting. And I'm not in the moment and I'm not present. And then I'm ready to go. And there he is, man. There's that new guy I made the mistake of being nice to when I showed up early. <laughs> And he's sitting there looking like a lost sheep. There were 60 men at the meeting. He let all of them go home waiting for me. <laughs> you know how long I'm sober? Do you know how much service I do in Alcoholics Anonymous? Do you know what? Do you think you could give me a ride home? <laughs> and I can think all that stuff I want as long as the answer is you bet. And he never lives in my county, ever. <laughs> But I'm driving him home, right? And I'm driving him home, and I have no gratitude, right? I'm thinking about I'm going to get to that halfway house. I know the one that he lives in. they got a bigger big screen than I do. i got a resentment about that. <laughs> I'm just going to slow down when we get there. I'm not even going to stop the car. I'm going to open the door and go, roll, newcomer, roll, you know? And, just... <laughs> and I'm doing the math, right? I'm doing the math. Okay, it'll be about 40 minutes round trip. And I'll still get I'll be able to get some food. I'll be able to watch the second issue of ESPN Sports News. It'll be okay. And, uh, and you know what happens. He starts talking, I start listening. And I start talking, he starts listening. And God's in the middle. And I pull over in front of that halfway house, and now I don't want him to roll. And I shut down the engine, I got nowhere to be. And I turn and I face him, and he turns and faces me. And we're just a couple of guys in the grip of this thing called alcoholism, trying to buy each other some time while the master works on us. And now I don't care about ESPN. I don't care about dinner. I have a sincere desire to help this young man. And I found myself saying things that were impossible 45 minutes earlier. Like, hey, where are you going to a meeting tomorrow night? Do you have a way to get there? It'd be my pleasure to pick you up. And we have a wonderful time. And whether he calls me or not the next day, I'm overpaid. And he'll walk into the halfway house and I'll drive home. And I can't get the grin off my face. And I'll be thinking, I wonder what the little people are doing tonight. <laughs> Because I'm living large in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I get that experience all the time, and I still forget it. And I'm ungrateful more often than I should be. I'm running short on time. I want to tell you a story, and I want to sit down. You've heard that before. <laughs> 2004, my beautiful wife, Eileen, decided she didn't want to leave in Los Angeles anymore. She has some crazy idea about living someplace beautiful and less hectic, and all my arguments were about money and uh, property and prestige, and luckily I was smart enough to know that she's uh, more spiritual than I am, and we took the leap of faith, and we moved to Bellingham, Washington. If you don't know where Bellingham is, go to Seattle, drive about 100 miles north, stop about 20 miles short of the Canadian border, and there's Bellingham. We're right up there at the Canadian border. America's first defense against Canada. And, uh, <laughs> and I mean, it was a culture shock. We're city kids. We're from L.A., man. We're concrete, steel, and glass. 
And suddenly I'm out, you know, I'm out, out eight miles out of town, out in the woods. And I mean, it's dark at night. I mean, it's darkity dark, dark. You know what I mean? And <laughs> I remember the first time I forgot something out in my car and uh, I didn't have the porch light on. And I'm just walking out to my car and it's so dark. And I got halfway to the car and a little voice in my head said, cougar. And I just jumped up in the air. And just, <laughs> I ran back in the house and slammed the door and I'm up against the door and... <laughs> My wife's like, what's with you? And I go, dark out there. Darkity dark, dark. Because <laughs> we're city kids, man. I remember we take these day trips, and we're out in the county, you know, and they have all these beautiful, like, postcard dairy farms with rolling green hills and gorgeous Jersey cows, and everybody's happy. It looks like a commercial. And, one day we're driving out there on this two-lane road, and my wife goes, oh, stop the car, stop the car. And this Jersey cow, this beautiful cow, was right up against the fence line. And so Eileen jumps out of the car, and she's right in the middle of the road trying to get a picture of this cow. And about this time, around the corner comes this old, old pickup truck, just go, 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 go. And it comes up, so she gets out of the way, and it turns into this old, old farmer, man. And he pulls up right next to my wife and stops, slowly rolls down the window. My wife goes, oh, I'm sorry, was I in your way? And he goes, no, no, that's okay. I, I just thought, I, is it okay if I ask you something? And she goes, yeah, of course. And he goes, you do know it's a cow. <laughs> and Eileen goes, uh-huh. And he goes, just checking. And then drives <laughs> off. And he, so we're city kids, man, and we got wildlife. We got bear and cougar and raccoon and possum, and we got deer, man. We got deer coming out of our ears and just, man, we got deer in our yard every day. And when we moved there, man, the first summer, the mama deers are showing up at those spotted ponds. We lost our mind. If anybody needs 20,000 digital photographs of a baby deer, see me after the meeting. <laughs> we fell in love with these deer, man. And this one deer in particular is a little boy deer. I liked him because he was brave and he was curious. He'd run right up to you and then run away. And the other deer never got close to me. He's a little tiny deer. He had this big scar across his face. And so I made up a story in my mind about how he was defending his mom's honor and got stomped or something. And, and we're city kids, so we're naming a deer. That's mama deer and scratch, you know what I mean? And, <laughs> and then fall and the running season comes along and the deer start shedding their summer coats and putting on their winter coats, but not scratch. He starts getting real patchy on his coat, and he starts having bald spots. And I remember saying to my wife, I go, Scratch is looking, I don't know, kind of ugly. She goes, yeah, he is. And my wife's like, that girl, man. She gets on the Internet and researches it and reports back to me. It's an actual affliction they get where we live. And in their first year, they can get a thing called hair loss syndrome. And if they get it bad enough, they'll lose all their fur. And then winter will come. They won't be able to eat enough to keep their furnace going. And they'll get hypothermic, and they'll die. And she reports this back to me. I go, Scratch is going to die? And she goes, yeah. And I go, oh, not on our watch. And, uh, <laughs> and we started to break every Washington State wildlife management law on the books, man. <laughs> I'm going to the feed store ordering sacks of 50-pound cob with molasses to put in my Toyota Avalon. And the, <laughs> the guy behind the counter is like, how many heads you got? And I'm like, I don't know how many head with this feed. And he'd go... <laughs> He goes, I don't know, two? I go, I got two. So I'm lying. I'm, uh. And my wife is setting up, fun, you know, supplemental feeding stations in our backyard. Well, when you're trying, you can't feed the one sick deer. You put food out. Suddenly we got deer coming from everywhere. I got 30 deer in my backyard. Somebody's, it's running season. There are 130-pound bucks in my backyard. My wife's five foot three, 120 pounds. She's out in the backyard chasing these bucks out. You're selfish. You're self-centered. Let the sick one eat. <laughs> Where am I? Where's the tough guy? I'm on the deck safely going, be careful. Be careful. <laughs> and it's not working, man. It's not working. I mean, Scratch is getting worse and worse, and I'm obsessed with this baby deer. I'd go to work, but I'd call my wife from work. I'd go, hey, did Scratch come by? And she'd go, yeah, I saw him. i go, how's he doing? She'd go, not good. And I'd shake my fist at God, and I'd say, God, not this one. You don't get this one. And so we're feeding him, we're feeding him, nothing's working. Now it's winter, man. This poor little guy has lost all the fur in his body, except for two inches wide, two inches high, from the nap of his neck to his rump. And he just sits in our backyard, and we've overfed him, so he's round like a beer cake. And he just, <laughs> he can barely move. 
He just stands in my backyard. This ugly newcomer mohawk. <laughs> Just eating and pooping. <laughs> and he's dumb like every newcomer, you know? We're building shelters in the backyard and the snow's coming. There's a snowstorm, but there's a shelter. He's standing two feet from the shelter, shivering <laughs> in the snow. I'm in there, I'm like, the shelter scratch, the shelter, well, you know. <laughs> it's not that bad yet, you know? <laughs> He's so one of us, you know? And the, <laughs> the idiot in you sees the idiot in me, sees the idiot in you. And oh my God. And then we make it to spring and he doesn't die. And for the next three or four years, every rutting season, he would come down from the high country with the other boys. And by this time, he's a magnificent buck. This huge rack. And he'd show up in our backyard. We know it was him because of the scar in his face. And he would just slowly walk up to my wife. And my wife could feed him apples by hand. And I would watch that scene and I would think to myself, what was it about that damn deer that made me lose my mind? And one day it hit me. I'm that damn deer. I'm that newcomer in the Simi Valley Alano Club with my back against the wall, my sunglasses on at night, where anyone with a glancing familiarity with alcoholism would have taken one look at me and said, that guy, that guy over there, he's going to die. And two good members of Alcoholics Anonymous saw the same thing, looked at each other and said, uh, not on our watch. And they did what we do in Alcoholics Anonymous, and they gave me that spiritual first aid. And I want to tell you something that I'm as sure of as the fact I'm standing here tonight is Bill and Bob are gone. They left us a beautiful legacy. But it's our watch now. And while we've been here this weekend, safe, sane, and sober, having some laughs, enjoying fellowship, the fruits of the program, they're out there in the streets tonight, and they are dying. And more importantly, it's that we understand that they are coming to our respective home groups. They are on the way. They are finishing up their stories. And they are going to show up in our respective home groups the way we showed up. Hopeless, helpless, hapless, not knowing what else to do, not having a plan B, knowing this won't work for a, in a million years. But they're going to show up lost. And the question we have to ask ourselves as good AA members is, where will we be? And more importantly, how will we be? Am I going to be in my AA meeting with my buddies talking about fantasy football, talking about my finishing trip, talking about my latest business deal? Or am I going to leave all that crap in the parking lot where it belongs? Am I going to be on point with my eyes trained on the doors and trained on the room the way my first sponsor and his sponsor were there for me? Am I going to remember that it's just another Monday night for me, Tuesday night for me, Wednesday night for me, Thursday night for me, whatever night I'm in an AA meeting, it's just another night for me, but it could be somebody's last night. And I got to tell you, I show up in Alcoholics Anonymous and I'm not spiritually prepared. I show up in AA and I got the whole world hanging all over me. I got a real job out there slaying dragons, you know what I mean, doing a man's job. And I show up at AA and I'm in the wrong condition. I'm in the wrong state to attend an AA meeting. And that's okay. I'm only human. But I've learned to not shut down the rig. Don't get out. Don't get out. Say a prayer. And I say a prayer to some variation of this. Dear God, I'm at an AA meeting. I got the world hanging all over me. I got my money problems. I got my sex problems. I got my me problems. And they all feel really important. Uh, let me, let me, I always want you to know I'm going to leave this stuff in the front seat of this truck and I'm going to go in there because I know there's men in there that need my help. Please help me to be less selfish. Give me eyes to see. Give me a heart to, that feels. Let me be there for the next man the way they were there for me. Thank you, God. And now I can get out of the truck. And now I can go to an AA member. It only takes 30 seconds to remember why I come to AA and what my job is when I get there. And I got to tell you, it's made all the difference in the world. You've been a great audience. I hope we stay sober forever. And I hope we remember they're coming to AA and they're coming looking for us. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.